Today I'll be talking about cracking the DNA mixture code, computer analysis of United Kingdom crime cases. I'm going to start with a case that we worked on in Leicestershire. Uh, this was a bank robbery of a NatWest bank. And in the m one morning, uh, gunmen entered the bank. Uh, here you see uh, a man wearing a black balaclava holding on to a sort of shotgun, which he's now pointing as he's walking through the back bank. Uh, he's wearing a light brown parka. And on the right of the slide, you see a handgun. And that handgun was uh, fired during the course of the robbery. Uh, as as the gunman is standing next to the teller, pointing a gun, you can see with the red arrow uh, the black shoes that he's wearing that are sort of distinctive with white laces. Uh, fortunately, the workers in the bank managed to escape to a safe room. Uh, the robbers fled uh, without having hurt, harmed anyone or taken any money. And they uh, began uh, on the bottom of the picture uh, in uh, Lutterworth and then headed north in a Volvo, switched cars to a Range Rover. Uh, and then, unfortunately for them, there was a police helicopter that watched them halfway through as they drove to their presumably safe house in uh, Broughton Astley. So in the car that was found outside the house, uh, there was a brown parka that looks a lot like uh, the parka that was seen in the video surveillance camera uh, from the bank. And there's also a um, bl black balaclava that you can see inside uh, the Adidas bag that was uh, they left empty-handed with from the robbery. And there on the floor of the house, inside the house, are the, this distinctive pair of black shoes. Okay, well, uh, so we have some items of evidence, a balaclava, a parka, some shoes, and these were tested for DNA. So I'm going to talk briefly uh, about biology of DNA. Uh, on the left, you see a cell uh, with the nucleus. The human body has trillions of such cells. And inside the nucleus, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. There's a chromosome shown in the center. And the chromosome is a packing of text. There are three billion letters in the human genome. And it's read out just like text uh, from left to right. It, it, it's a coding of different instructions for operating a cell, growing an organism, uh, disease, and so on. And if you open up to a particular portion and you see a location, which is called a locus, then you're reading letter by letter in the four-letter DNA code of A, C, G, and T of what those sentences are. And here's a way of looking at the, the 10 markers that are used in the United Kingdom. These are short tandem repeats. So on the left, there's an encyclopedia uh, in book form. I understand that's no longer going to be printed anymore, but uh, conceptually, they'll still be on CD, I guess, or on, online. And there, so think of 23 volumes, so that 3 billion letters are packaged into 23 volumes. And in, from this encyclopedia, if you open up to some paragraph, paragraphs can be distinguished by the opening sentence and the final sentence. And, if that, and that's how scientists identify these locations and create them. So for example, if, uh, translating to English for a second, if a sentence begins, it was the best of times it was the worst of times, and so on. You know the rest. Um, and then when you get to the end of the first paragraph of A Tale of Two Cities, suppose it ends a uh, degree of comparison. Well, by knowing the starting sentence shown in red and the ending sentence shown in red, a person could use a computer to find that paragraph. And scientists use DNA mo molecules called PCR primers in the same way that chemically identify that paragraph. And these paragraphs are selected by scientists for variation. So they're selected to have variation in the middle, somewhere in the middle, and there's a word. So we're all going 
direct to heaven, we are all going direct the other way in, and I took the liberty of changing Dickens just a little, in short, 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 ten words, and so there's ten repeats of that short word. And so in this particular copy of this encyclopedia, at that volume, at that paragraph, the allele length, or the variation, would be ten repeated words. And that's what's used as the basis of identity with short tandem repeats, is how many times the word is repeated. And you can see that the more that the word's repeated, the longer the paragraph would be. And scientists can measure the length of the paragraph to determine how many times a word is repeated. And that's the basis of STR, or short tandem repeat technology. So the, the key concept in genetic identification is the genotype. And what the DNA genotype is, is that as you move from a chromosome and chromosome and unravel it into a particular locus, there are two copies uh, of this location, one from the mother, one from the father, and then there are these repeated words. If in a population there are 15 or 20 different lengths, they're selected for variation. So you may have five, six, seven, maybe up to 20 or 25 um, different variations of how many times that word is repeated, uh, then there are over 100 pairings of those 20 alleles. So there are over 100 allele pairs at a locus. And this is really good for distinguishing people. And that's the, the whole point of DNA identification, is to be able to distinguish between different people because these highly variable regions have distinguishing features, these genotypes where one person might have a 10-12, someone else might have a 9-9, someone else a 5-17, and that way uh, people can be uh, reasonably well identified because uh, the genotypes are relatively unique. By looking at 10 loci, not just one, uh, there's even more distinguishing information. So that's the basis of what a genotype is and what an SDR marker is. DNA evidence conceptually is interpreted the same way by all methods of analysis, and I'll describe it to you in overview. On the left, we see an evidence item. I'm indicating two different colors of DNA, suggesting that it comes from two different people, uh, and it's a mixture of at least two people. And then the laboratory, indicated by the arrow, transforms that biological material by extracting, amplifying, and separating by size to obtain data. And you'll see more data in a second, but just in a cartoon overview, what evidence data looks like is a series of different allele sizes, which is, depends on the length of the paragraph at that location. Um, and here we see 10 repeats, 11 repeats, 12 repeats. Uh, those are the different alleles. Since people only have two parents, if you see three alleles, that would suggest there's two or more contributors to this DNA sample, that what you're looking at is a mixture. Then the question is, once this data is obtained, how do you infer something from that in order to determine what the genotype would be? So at this one locus, imagine that the, the major contributor is pretty clearly a 12-12. The question is, what's the genotype of the second contributor, the minor contributor? And this is just a represent, representation that's showing a list of genotype values, 10-12, uh, 11-12, 12-12, we begin with 100 or so of these different possibilities, and what the data does is it restricts those possibilities, and you don't need to have just one value, like with a reference sample. There's tremendous information in having a reduced list with probabilities attached that have been scientifically formed. And the probabilities that are shown is just a list of numbers that express belief based on some solid reasoning that add up to 100%. That evidence genotype uh, is determined objectively without ever looking at a reference suspect, otherwise there's bias, and that's not good for criminal justice. Uh, but once the genotype shown on the right, say for this minor contributor, at this one locus is written down, a comparison can then be made against a known genotype in order uh, to establish a strength of match, and I'll show you how that works as well. So here is one of the 10 loci. Uh, this is from the parka, 
uh, one of the cuffs of the coparca at locus tho one and this is quantitative peak height data and what that means is when you have DNA data you don't just have a bunch of definite values of saying I know that this allele is there or not you have an extent of data this random variation from uh, the laboratory experiments from the PCR, in which you get are quantitative peak heights that reflect, with random variation, the underlying quantities of each allele. So this is a mixture of three or four people, which is why there's more than one or two peaks here. On the x-axis, we're seeing the size, that's the length of the paragraph, and the numbers on top are the numbers of repeats, six, seven, eight, nine. Phil one has a special one called 9.3. Uh, you can think of it as 10 with a slight change in somewhere else in the sentence. Uh, so the, that's the length of the DNA shown on the bottom. And then the height is fluorescence units. After the DNA is amplified and it's read out on the sequencer, separated by size, the intensity of how, mo how many molecules are present is reflected in the height of the peaks. So what you get is a pattern. It's actually, you'll see it's important that the pattern has a tremendous amount of information in it. Now, people may use less of the data. And typical human review, once you go beyond a single contributor, tries to simplify the data. Now, to, in computers and statistics, we don't do that. We, uh, Bayesian reasoning uses all the data without change. But people are looking at a lot of data. They're doing it pretty much by eye. And so they make they make simplifications. The standard simplification is to apply a threshold. Uh, the threshold is sliced across the peaks at some height that the lab predetermines for their data. And the result is, is that peaks over the threshold, as indicated by the blue bars, are considered to be in. They're considered to be alleles. They may or may not be, but often they are. And the peaks under the threshold are considered to not be alleles. They're thrown out. Notice that the quantitative information is gone. You don't know how much of anything is present. The pattern is gone of the highs moving to the lows, as well as information about random variation that computers can use. So with all of this information thrown out, it's not surprising that the DNA report from the laboratory said that there was no information here. For the balaclava, the lab report uh, from, uh, this was a UK laboratory, uh, said that from inside the crown area of the balaclava, there was a c complex mixed DNA from at least four people. And the, the opinion, not an objective computer result, but a subjective human inspection of the reduced data, was that the result is not suitable for a meaningful comparison. So out went the balaclava. The lab reported on the shoes. It looked in, uh, inside the heel area and the toe area of the left shoe. Uh, in blue highlighted, it shows there were mixed DNA results of at least three people. And that, in their opinion, Leroy Williams, who was a suspect in the case, could have contributed to the DNA, but, as shown in red at the bottom, however, due to the overall complexity of the results and the number of contributors to them, a statistical evaluation is not possible using thresholds and using visual inspection of the data, of course. Similarly, with the parka, the lab reported that the left and right cuff areas of the brown parka uh, showed uh, a complex mixed DNA results originating from at least four people, which in my opinion, said the author, this result is not suitable for a meaningful comparison. They go on to say about another area, a mixed DNA result from the parka appear to originate it from at least three people. And in their opinion, Leroy Williams could have contributed DNA to this result. However, as shown in red, the finding is not suitable for statistical evaluation. So now we have three amazing pieces of DNA evidence. Uh, there's a lot of data there. There's tall peaks, there's short peaks. There's a lot of stuff going on. And the conclusion of a usual, well-trained expert in DNA using what's done every day in the world, 99% of the evidence, is there's no information here. Okay, so that's our starting point. The computer has a different way of looking at evidence, and I'll show you what that is now. And I'm talking about the true allele system and how it thinks. 
So what it does instead is it starts with the data. There's a pattern underneath this that we saw of high peaks at 6 and 7, trailing off to 8 and 9 and 9.3. And not being a person, it's not starting by looking at surface features of the data. It's trying out almost every possibility by computer simulation, 100,000 different times, of what are the different genotypes and their quantities, and how do they add and stack up to compare against the pattern. So uh, in this one out of 100,000 uh, proposals, we see in blue, uh, a pair of rectangles representing equal amounts of an allele pair 6 and 7. In orange, there's another pair of rectangles representing a second genotype from a second person, a pair of alleles, and that's another person's allele pair. And then in green, we see a third person's allele pair. And when you add them up, for example, at 6, you see how the blue adds to the orange. The tops of those rectangles are very close to the tops of those peaks. It's a very good explanation. And therefore, since it explains the peak pattern well, that explanation has a higher likelihood. And the genotypes underlying that for each of the three contributors uh, ends up with higher probability. But the computer moves these rectangles all over the place, where the data is, where the data isn't. Most of the patterns don't even resemble the data. They get lower intermediate probabilities and the ones that better explain the data get higher probabilities. When it's all done, at each locus, for each of the three contributors, there's a genotype probability that's produced for the evidence. So this is the one for the major contributor. And what's happened is that 100, those 100 possible allele pairs have largely concentrated their probability into allele pair 6, 7, into that genotype out of 100. And the, this genotype for the first of three contributors at the tho one locus was determined objectively, solely from the data. It has no idea who Leroy Williams is or anyone else on the, on the DNA database in the, in the UK. It's totally objective. It has not seen any reference. And this is done for each of the three contributors at each of the 10 loci. Now that we have this objectively derived genotype, how do we get a match statistic? Well, fortunately, the likelihood ratio, uh, which was invented in uh, the UK during the end of World War II by Alan Turing, lets us take a look at the probability distribution of the evidence genotype, compare it with a reference, which could also be a probability distribution, relative to a random person, relative to just what is out in the population, and put those three pro genotypes together, uh, often with probability, to get a number that summarizes how much more does the suspect match the evidence than a random person. Uh, a way of looking at it is this. We had 100 possibilities. Now, for the f uh, in, in blue, we see what the evidence is telling us. In brown, and again, the number of possibilities for 100 genotypes would go around the room. We're only focusing on these three. For the first time, we take that red cursor and we slide it over to the suspect's genotype. And mathematically, that focuses all of our attention on only what's happening at allele pair value 6, 7. We can, for 99% of what we're doing, we can ignore the rest. We look at the ratio of the blue bar, the evidence genotype, to the brown bar, random population, and we see that it's bigger by around 10 times. That is the probability of an evidence match divided by the a coincidental match, and that factor of 10 at locus tho 1 is the likelihood ratio. It's the change in information that the evidence has, has told us um, about this suspect. This is done at 10 locations, uh, tho ones indicated on the bottom. Uh, because of the relative rarity of this genotype, uh, there are some likelihood ratios over 200. There's one over 100. Uh, the x-axis is showing the likelihood ratios, and the scale goes out to 250 for the 10 loci shown. If you multiply those 10 numbers together, we can now mathematically address 
how much support there is in the evidence that the suspect is included. And one can state that a match between the Parker and Leroy Williams is 10 quadrillion times more probable than a coincidental match to an unrelated black person. For the shoe, a match between the shoe and Leroy Williams, uh, that has a likelihood ratio of 13.9 quadrillion. And the match statistic for the balaclava relative to Leroy Williams and a black population is about 15 quadrillion. Uh, if you are wondering how big 15, 10 quadrillion is, it's a number one shown on the top followed by 16 zeros. So from the computer's perspective, this is basically the same as a single source match. The major contributor was that clear. And um, we didn't testify at this trial. There was enough other, enough other evidence. Uh, but the conclusion was that Leroy Williams uh, received a 15-year sentence uh, for this particular bank robbery. So what do we learn from this? But True Allele is an objective, reliable, truth-seeking tool. It's a computer system that automatically interprets DNA mixtures, low-level DNA, and so on, without any human intervention once it starts solving. It solves the mixture problem. It can handle relatives. We've done cases with five relatives, um, up to six contributors, low-copy, degraded DNA. Its goal is to provide accurate DNA statistics. And if you speak with the many prosecutors, police, and defense attorneys we've worked with, um, after an hour or two, it's very easy to understand, and juries find it easy to understand. It's easy to explain. It automates the DNA evidence interpretation process. The take-home lesson for investigators here is that when you read a report that says, there's data here, but a meaningful comparison or a statistical evaluation is not possible, there's usually information there, and uh, True Allele is often a highly effective way of continuing the process to get a result. How do we know the system is reliable? Because we've done over 20 validation studies, most of them with crime labs and collaborators. These are five published peer-reviewed validation studies. Uh, the next to last one was with New York State. It came out in November. Uh, the bottom one uh, came out last month. It was done with Virginia, an extensive study uh, establishing the sensitivity, specificity, and reproducibility of true allele on 72 reported cases uh, that were reported out using true allele. Uh, and actually, the, all but the middle one actually are available uh, as public access. Um, and the comparisons with human review generally shows the loss of information. For example, the Virginia study shows that on challenging mixtures of three or more contributors, on average, human review, when it can get an answer at all, loses a billion-fold information in the match statistic from a validated computer value to a human guess. True allele has been used in uh, criminal trials. There have been about 200 case reports uh, filed on DNA evidence. Uh, in the US, courtroom testimony has been given in many state courts, in federal court, at a military court martial, um, as well as uh, outside the US internationally uh, for crimes of armed robbery, child abduction, child molestation, murder, rape, terrorism, and weapons possession. Uh, in the United Kingdom and Commonwealth countries, uh, true allele has been used in a number of, of cases, but we've analyzed um, and have documented results in at least 22 cases. Uh, the countries include Australia, Canada, England, uh, where there are eight cases and 10 cases in Northern Ireland. And the crimes tend to be serious if you're going to bring in a technology like True Allele uh, as a specialty analysis. Uh, I described the armed robbery, uh, but most of the cases have been homicides with 14 murders, uh, two rapes, and four uh, terrorist cases, some of which uh, were homicides as well. So True Allele today is, is about 20 years old. That's when we first invented the math and the first algorithms. The first computer systems were developed 15 years ago. Uh, there are 10 laboratories uh, th that are in various stages of bringing in or using it. We provide support for users and their workflow. Uh, and a tremendous amount of education. They have to unlearn that you can draw a line and make a guess 
and learn that there are concepts of how science can look at data, not change it, and objectively and reliably update genotypes and from that uh, develop match statistics. Uh, there are three labs that are now online with this, including uh, the state of Virginia and Kern County in California. Uh, there have been over 20 validation studies. Um, as I mentioned, five of them uh, are uh, published. We give a lot of talks on our uh, YouTube channel of True Allele, which I'll mention at the end. Uh, there are over 50 presentations that uh, explain how True Allele works in the context of crimes and science for lawyers, the public, forensic scientists. Uh, if you want the math, you can read the appendix of the papers. Um, there have been about five admissibility hearings. Uh, any ruling that's been given as a written ruling has been uh, favorable for True Allele. Uh, I've been to court about 20 times. Other forensic analysts in the U.S. have been going to court as well. Uh, we've been spending a lot of effort educating lawyers and laymen that there is a real scientific way to interpret complex DNA evidence and not just call it inconclusive. And a lot of work has gone on in the wording of our match statistics, which is based on the math formulas, to make statements that are understandable, like a match between the evidence and an individual is a billion times more probable than coincidence. That's based on math that gives the same number as more complex formulas with more complex wordings. So the purpose of Trulil is to use all the DNA evidence, every locus, every peak, everything, whether it looks like a galaxy in a scatter plot or it looks definite, and it's used to eliminate DNA backlogs to speed up the DNA process. It's all done by computers. There's a lab who we're working with whose workflow is to take the evidence in batch mode, put entire plates of data up, and not even look at the case until the local da their data, Trulial database says, in this case, we found these comparisons. And that's how they think of the process now. It's something where interpretation, matching, comparison, and reporting is done by machine. And they can focus on forensic questions. It can give a tremendous reduction in forensic costs because you're not paying people to give no information after a long period of time. Um, and it can solve crimes, find criminals. It's been used uh, to, to aid in guilty convictions. Most outcomes are guilty pleas with True Allele because it brings DNA back to the level of single source DNA. It's also uh, been used in uh, at least 10 cases for um, the defense. Uh, some of which have resulted in innocent people uh, not being convicted. And the overall goal of cybergenetics in this te technology is to use all the data to create a safer society. If you're interested in more truly ill information, our website is www.cybgen.com and the information section has half a lifetime of reading courses, videos, papers, presentations, uh, this presentation will be posted up there at some point along with the slides. Um, and there's also a YouTube channel uh, called True Allele uh, where you can watch videos as well. Thank you very much.